Well, now let's move on to phase shifters and radiating elements in the phased array antennas section of the antenna lecture. Um, I just took a break between the, the, this uh, first section, which I recorded all in one 55-minute piece. We'll break that down for sure into probably three pieces to make it easier for you to digest. But uh, the, the, uh, to give you a little bit of hope, um, it, it looks like we're just a little bit more than half through. We, we're, we're probably 40 more view graphs to go, but a lot of them are pictorial in nature to give you uh, visualizations of what I'm going to be talking about. So it'll be, it won't be at, at all about like the theory of understanding grading lobes and, uh, and linear and phased array radars and that sort of thing. So actually, uh, I started off lecture nine from just up here. So we, we've gone through most of it. It, it you know, we've, it, this is, this is stuff's going to go move, I think, a, a fair amount faster. Let's see. The one thing I don't want you to do is not understand as I have always said, this is a course that I wish I had taken in graduate school before I came to work uh, at Lincoln Laboratory. And I would have felt, gee, I got really well trained. I was excellent training in radar before I went on to do this stuff. But what happened is I learned it all through 35 years or so at the lab, over 35 years stretch. Okay. Let's go back. I've taken my mind off my. Uh, I, I must confess that I went back in the, uh, the section on antenna illumination. I mentioned uh, uh, inverse Fourier transforming the uh, current distribution uh, to get the electric field. And the first time I did it, I just said Fourier transforming. So I had to redo that. I got a little too carried away, trying to be a little bit care more careful. Anyway, we're going to study phase shifters, and we're going to study radiating elements in phase arrays. Okay, so why do we want to do phase shifters? This is the big picture thing, and I think you all understand that. I showed you a picture before of trade X. You, you, you want to move the trade X beam from one position to another. I'm just putting the order of 20 degrees and the magnitude, order of magnitude of seconds. You mo want to move a Patriot radar beam. There's a phased array. Uh, you can move it in the order of magnitude of microseconds. Now, that gives this radar a lot faster beam agility than this radar. And so that's a super neat thing. And, and it, like if you want to keep a lot of aircraft targets in track and you want to track them fast so you can use it to uh, guide missiles to, uh, to them, uh, you, want, you want to have a high update rate. You want to be able to go from one target to another fast and not slowly like uh, Tradex, uh, the, where targets might be located at different places and angle. The phase array is certainly the way to go, and you want to go there fast. So if the phase of each element in an array antenna can be rapidly changed, then, so we can point the direction of the antenna, okay? Modern phase shifters can change their phase in the order of microseconds. And this development has really revolutionized in the, in the last score of years military radar development. Uh, the ability to simultaneously t detect and track large numbers of high-velocity targets over a very large solid angle. And since then, the main issue has been what it always is at the end, cost. And the quest is for the, you'd like to be able to have a $100 element. That's what I call it. And uh, uh, I'll, when I see when I believe it. And I don't mean just the element, there's the element, the stuff that holds the element, the power supply, the whole the whole nine yards of it, you know. And so that's the, it, it's, it's the, getting the low cost, the cost down is a prime driver of those who work hard in this a great technology area. Now phase shift is how do they work? The phase shift that an electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave experiences is just given by 2 pi times the frequency times the 
path length divided by the velocity. And when we change uh, this just over, boom, 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 you get the square root of u e. The square root of the perme permeability and the dielectric constant, the permittivity. And modern shave sh phase shifters implement phase change in the antennas mainly by two methods. They change the path length, the L, with diode phase shifters, which act as switches, switching in and out different lengths of path, or they change the permeability along the wave path, which would be ferrite phase shifters. There are, a lot, there are other ways of doing it, but these are the main ones I'm going to give you a, a, a beginner's look at phase shifters. And electromagnetic waves interact with the ferrite's electrons to produce a change in the ferrite's permeability. Okay. Now here is a 4-bit phase shifter. And here we have a, a length of delay of 1 16th of a lambda, an eighth of lambda, a quarter lambda, and half of lambda. And, and you just switch in and out these different lengths. And the individual shade phase shifter bit is 22 and a half degrees. Then the way they're connected here, the total phase shift is 5 sixteenths of times lambda. And this would be called a 4-bit diode phase shifter. Now, a 4-bit latching ferrite diode shifter, what it does is it sh flips a bit, 0 from 0 to 180 degrees, um, by driving. So this one it does it 22 and a half, this 40. 45, 90, and 180, and with that, with drive lines going in, the microwave power goes in, it'll come out shifted. And two different technologies use this, it, and uh, they're very important. Microwave integrated circuit technology, which I'll get and show you what it is, MIC, I just wanted to define these terms, and monolithic microwave integrated circuit technology, which as it says is you've got microwave integrated circuit technology and it's all one chunk. You're not taking a lot of little chunks and putting them together. You're making uh, microwave integrated circuits as a whole. Okay, And at frequencies greater than S-band, ferrite phase shifters are often used. And diode phase shifters may be used above S-band, on receive, after low noise amplifier, an LNA, and before the power amplifier on transmit. And here are what different radiating elements in phase array antennas can look like. I showed you one that's different than this, and that is the, uh, the cross dipoles at an angle. And here is a metal diode strip with the energy coming up a transmission line. Uh, you can have printed circuit dipoles. And th th there'd be coupling structure. You can have a slot cut in a waveguide where power will go down, the electromagnetic will go down the waveguide. And you can have uh, a, a, a slot either vertical or at an angle radiating, a radiating edge slot. You can have notch radiators in strip line technology where the strip line is on the top and there's a notch in and the energy will radiate. You can have uh, rectangular patch radiators. Here we have a ground plane, a substrate, and then a, me a metal patch on top of the substrate. And here's the ground plane, and coming out the metal patch will be radiation. And you can have an open-ended waveguide, where energy will just go out the open-ended waveguide. The, as I've said before, and I'll say again, um, go to John Velakis's antenna handbook, and you're going to have 
a, a book that's this thick, just on, well, this thick, that's just on probably three or three and, three and a half inches, just on in antennas. So it's going to have a whole chunk on feed, on phase shifters. So I'm just giving you the, the light when I go that far. Now on antenna feed architectures, how do you tie these all together? I've just shown you a linear array and a planar array and alluded to you could have circular arrays. How do you feed the energy down from a transmitter or do you have, what kind of structure do you have between the system that's the transmitter and the receiver and these antennas? Okay, And how they are generated and distributed to the elements. Well, there are two ways generally that it's done, what we call a passive array and an active array. A passive array, you'll have a single or sometimes a few transmitters, you know, one or two, uh, from which high power is distributed to the individual array elements where individual phase shifters will do the phase shifting. Okay, and what you'll have is a lot of waveguide going around where it's all passed out. And then you could have active arrays, as we call them, where each array element has its own transmitter receiver, what I'll refer to as TR module. And TR modules are going to be discussed in more detail in lecture. We're going to discuss them later. <laughs> uh, I believe... No, it's in transmitters. Yeah, no, it's in lecture 17. In 17, um, TR modules will be discussed in, in a lot more detail. And then there are constrained feeds and space feeds, and I'll get to them. Excuse me for the typo again. As I said, when I put this up on the web, I'll uh, change the, the, the PDFs and leave this in um, just for the sake to show you that I'm not a, um, you know, uh, like a newscaster on CBS News who has a teleprompter in front of them. Uh, okay, the concepts for feeding array antennas. We've got unconstrained feeds which use waveguides or rather microwave transmission lines. A conventional method for 2D scan is frequency scan in one dimension and phase shifters in the other, and you'll see that in more detail later. We can have space-fed arrays, which distribute energy to a lens array or a reflect array. And I'll go over with pictures to show you what they are. They're generally less expensive than constrained feed arrays, and they're not able to radiate very high power. The space, and what, what I mean very, very high power, and the use of subarrays, where an antenna array may be divided into a number of subarrays to facilitate the division of power to and from the antenna elements. And the Aegis radar antenna, which you've seen pictures of earlier, utilizes 32 transmit and 68 receive subarrays in its uh, phase, in its array. Now let's look at active elements and say, what does that look like to my eye. We've got low power transmitted pulses to the transmit receive modules and they go out and they will go into a subarray which will transmit the energy and the phase information that needs to be adjusted in each TR module. So low power goes out and the subarray will distribute the turn-on, turn-offs, and the phase shifting orders to each TR module in the subarray. And here we have four sets of subarrays. And the receiver output, which comes back, will go to A to D's in processing. In a passive array, the transmission will have a one or two a lot of the times one high power transmitter and then a duplexer which will make sure that the high power doesn't get into the receiver as we talked earlier and then the passive array will send out energy to the subarray 
And this will be pretty high energy because it isn't going to get amplified in a transmitter and a TR module. And then it will just go through a phase shifter and then out each individual uh, array element. So the phase shifter, phase shifting will be done outside of the subarray. And the transmitter amplification will be done in the high power transmitter. So these are high power lines going into subarrays, which will distribute out uh, this one. I've got five, an odd number, but five elements. Well, it probably would have a divider where one-fifth of the energy would go into each of these elements, still high power, and have its phase individually shifted, etc. As you can imagine, for splitting purposes, these would tend to be powers of twos. Okay, now let's look at some examples of active arrays. Uh, the early warning radars, uh, uh, this one I believe is in Thule. Uh, it's a UHF early warning radar, and it is an active array. There are transmitters behind each and every one of the antenna elements I showed you earlier. And, uh, and here is the FAD, High Altitude Theater, a high altitude defense system, an X band, it's a phased array, and there are thousands of X band TR modules behind this uh, ray dome. Uh, this is a counter battery radar that was a joint venture between, uh, between uh, I believe, uh, Lockheed Martin built the antenna. And uh, the Thales Group in England is the whole system contractor. It's a counter-battery radar, which looks up, sees artillery shells, and while they're in flight, uh, tracks them and says, at that XY is where the artillery is locate, piece is located, and then sends the information and coordinates, Zappo, over to uh, artillery pieces, which automatically go to those coordinates, and before you can say, let's get out of here quick, the whole place is, uh, is plastered with uh, counter-battery fire. And then here, uh, the APG-81, which is a, uh, an active array uh, that's in the F-35 fighter. You can see all these tiny little goodies there, transmit-receive modules. And now some examples. Uh, see, I'd save lots of pictures. Uh, here are some examples of passive arrays. Uh, there are, as I told you before, how the, the uh, array structure was divided up to Aegis. Here is one of its uh, arrays. And there are thousands of elements with phase shifters in each of these arrays. And then behind it is a feed structure, which feeds into uh, one set of transmitters for each of the four faces that are on each of the different sides of the this is a cruiser. And Cobra Dane is another example of a passive array. Y yes, it's got each one of those uh, elements, but behind it there's a feed structure that goes to uh, uh, an L-band large power transmitter, which has this passive array structure, which I talked about earlier. 